Thank you, AI. Yeah. <laughs> that AI, you can't beat it. Of course, our kids are growing up with AI. I mean, the younger ones especially. So that's all they're ever going to know is AI. Grandpa, did you actually have to type stuff in? Yes, honey, I had to learn all these keys. Oh, yeah, that's that's so old, Grandpa. We we just we just talk to it. It tells us what we want to know. Yeah, but does it tell you what it wants you to know? <laughs> yes, it does. Whatever the propaganda is at the moment, that's what you're going to hear. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where we're headed very quickly. And uh, we're in the Revelation. And believe it or not, we're going to chapter seven. I spent a long time on six, but there was a lot of meat in there. So we're going to continue on. And today, how come you're not working, Mr. Machine? Oh, now we are. Just as a recap, so we always keep in mind the framework. Without the framework, you don't know where these things are occurring. Therefore, you can get mixed up. And that's that's one of my pet peeves. A lot of teachers of Revelation and prophecy, they go and pick something out of context, and they build a whole theory on it, but it doesn't match the rest of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it all has to, to line up. So that's, that's properly uh, interpreting the word. Line upon line, word upon word, and uh, doesn't mean that everything is going to be something that you or others agree with. But at least uh, if I say something and I don't have word to base this on, base it on, then come up and call me out. Mm -hmm. If you think otherwise, then come up and say, "Hey, well, what about this scripture? I believe this. That's fine." But uh, if you believe something where there's no scripture for it, the odds are that that's probably not accurate. But anyway, so the, the tribulation really is seven years, and uh, that's been well established. And so Revelation from 6 to 19, the vast majority of the book deals with the tribulation. And uh, there's a beginning, a middle, uh, and an end. So uh, everybody pretty much agrees on that, even if they have different ideas. So what we're going to see today is in chapter 7, it's a parenthetical meaning that, you know, we're going along in, in chapter 6 in the timeline, and then all of a sudden God puts parentheses around a focus. He's going to focus in on two points in this chapter. And so we know where those points are. He's going to focus in on the be very beginning, uh, where 144,000 are going to be sealed. That's in the very, very beginning of the seven years. And then he's going to jump to the last three and a half years and talk about the martyred souls. And so we're going to be able to see, uh, like from this diagram, where those two concepts fit into the ABC. Uh, just to see the chapter by chapter outline. In the beginning, we had a vision of Christ. We had the historical churches. Then we saw the throne room, which was in the uh, eternal dimension. And then in chapter 6, we actually see an earthly timeline of events happening. And then in chapter 7, we kind of jump up. We're in heaven. He's showing us things uh, on the earth, but uh, from a perspective of uh, a definite focus here or focus there. And uh, we then will move on to further points. Uh, before I go any further, I need to uh, try to make it clear uh, as to the types of people we have now in the church age versus the types of people we're going to have in the tribulation. They're not the same. In the church age, as uh, Paul has definitely made clear, he says that we have uh, neither Jew nor Gentile. So what we have is a, um, a new type of being, and uh, Paul makes it clear to us. Again, Christ tutored Paul directly and gave him the deeper things, which he Christ was not able to share at that time when he was on earth, uh, purposely, purposely limited himself. So he said, I was sent only to the house of Israel. He only went to the Jews. It's about two or three times where he even had anything to do with Gentiles. And of course, you probably remember the centurion or the, the woman and came to him. And he, you know, he said, well, even the dogs, you know, get the crust of bread. So he did depart Syrophoenician woman at the well. I mean, there were some departures, but remember his disciples were flabbergasted that he even talked to a Gentile because he never did. 
because the Jews never did. Jews weren't allowed to go and talk to Gentiles. They weren't allowed to go into their houses. You couldn't even go in their house. So, uh, you know, we, we get kind of crazy ideas in the Christian world about what it was like back then, you know. Was Jesus a Christian? No, he was not a Christian. Oh, that's blasphemy. No, because there were no Christians. There were there were no Christians until Antioch, many years after he was crucified, risen, and, and arose. Many years later in Antioch, it says that's where Christian they were called Christians. Nobody before that time ever heard the name Christian. So obviously he's God. You know, he established everything that we believe as Christians. But I mean, you know, people couldn't have gone and said, Jesus, are you a Christian? He, that would be nonsensical. It had no meaning. Mm -hmm. So, that you, you know, we get crazy ideas about what it was like. But just to make it clear, Paul makes it very clear. And uh, he was given to have this deeper understanding. That is that you, in the time of Jesus and, uh, and afterwards, you uh, had Jews, Israelites, Hebrews, whatever you want to call them. And you had Gentiles who were the other group, not Jews. That's all. Jews and not Jews, right? Mm -hmm. So there were some some uh, heathen uh, heathen Gentiles who were heathens who accepted the God of Israel. They're called God fears, and they they made accommodation for them, but they weren't Jews. Um, and then, of course, the big the big takeaway here is today, from that time to today and and now, we have the church. The church is not Jews or Gentiles. So. Although, uh, you know, it's we're celebrating Passover and uh, the Jewish uh, festival, uh, you know, is commenced and all that. Um, <clears throat> and you have Messianic synagogues. According to the actual teaching of the scripture, there's no such thing as a Christian Jew or a Messianic Jew. That's something, you know, recent they've made up. Um, and that's fine if they want to, you know, believe in their heritage, but that's not according to what the Bible teaches. In other words, the Bible teaches you were a Jew. Now you're a Christian. You're a born again church member. You were a Gentile. Now, like myself, now you're a born again church member. There's three types of people in the world today. So if I go up to anybody, I say, are you a Jew? They're going to say, I'm a Jew. Are, are you, uh, are you a, uh, a Jew? No. Are you a church person? No. Well, that's a Gentile. That's a heathen. And then you have the church people. I'm not saying everybody in, in churches, whatever their name, are Christians or not. The real church is invisible. It's the born-again people. They may be in the Catholic Church, Presbyterian, Methodist. You know, Obviously, in our church, we have a lot of born-again people. But uh, so basically, that's how you get into to the church. So Jesus said, John 3, 3 and 3, 7, uh, you must be born again. I don't know how people miss that. <laughs> how can people miss that? I mean, so obviously, he said, you know, Nicodemus said, oh, you want me to crawl back into the womb? And he so clearly told them, no, you have to be born spiritually. And there's people that go, go to church all their life, and they've never been born spiritually. So if you say somebody, so I'm a Christian, when were you born again? Oh, I was never born again. Well, the odds are they're not a Christian. If you're not, in other words, when I was born again, not only did I know about it, my parents knew about it, my relatives knew about it, and all my friends knew about it. Okay. I was watching a show earlier today, kind of a cheesy thing, but it was about Sir Isaac Newton. And it, today is the day, and I believe 1744 is when he marked when he came back to God. Hmm. Yeah, all the early scientists were Christian. I mean, when I'm saying in the you know, hundreds of years ago, not in Greece, but. But yeah, in the Renaissance, uh, I think as far as I can, I'm aware, all of them were Christians. Mm -hmm. All the great scientists and founders of what we call science today were all Christians. So, um, but that's another matter. Um, so what we're trying to focus on here, because we're going into chapter seven, I want to make it clear that the people we're going to see in chapter seven are not church people. And it's obvious when you look at it in context that they're not church people. So what we have in the tribulation are people who have been gathered from all nations, and they are believers, but they're never referred to as being church people. The word church doesn't appear at all in the chapter 6 through 19. All the tribulation, ch chapter 6 through 19, dig all you want to. You're not going to find church anywhere in there because the church is not on earth. 
Um, and interestingly enough, in the first few chapters, there's seven mentions of church. So in the beginning, before the tribulation, we have seven mentions of church, ecclesia in the Greek. And then through the rest of the uh, revelation, there's no church, church until the very, very end chapter. So, um, but we're going to make it to that point. So anyway, where did they go? Well, obviously, people that understand and, and thoroughly understand the scripture from beginning to end understand that the rapture happens. That's why there's no church people. Where did they all go? They're, they disappeared. That's where they all went. So that leaves us with a real problem. God has a problem. And uh, we're going to see at that time, after the rapture, you're going to have earth dwellers. Um, so at that point, it's people aren't referred to as heathen, but what they are referred to in the Greek, literally, it says dwellers upon the earth. And I just put that into what English people would probably say, earth dwellers, what we call. Uh, so the earth dwellers are most of the vast majority of people. And then you have people who will be saved. You know, are those church people? No. Are they going to be saved? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit working? Yes. But he's working differently than he is now. So um, we're going to see that. We're going to see that those people who are in the tribulation that believe are called first fruits, um, particularly the ones that start off uh, as being sealed. So some people who might study have studied the feast in Judaism, first fruits means the very first guys in the tribulation saved. Right. So we have an is issue here of um, distinguishing in the tribulation between the earth dwellers. Remember, we the chapter 11 Hebrews says that we like Abraham, we're looking for a, a house and a land and a country that is not built with hands. It's not of this earth. We are not earth dwellers. You may act like an earth dweller. But if you're born again, you, you don't supposed to act like an earth dweller. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to always keep your mind on the heavenly dwelling. You're supposed to be dwelling in heaven, not earth. But the heathen, the unbelievers, they have no choice. They're earth dwellers whether they know it or not. And by their language and everything they do, they show they're earth dwellers. Everything they think about is making a, some kind of impact, getting money, establishing a career, uh, their children and their, you know, everything is focused on their house, their lands, and their things. And some of them are billionaires. To God, it doesn't matter if you have a zillion dollars or zero dollars. All those people that are earth dwellers are going to the pit. And it's not my opinion. It's what the word says clearly. So we hope they don't. You know, we witness those people. But the problem is when we're gone, who's going to witness to those people? Okay, a lot of them are building bunkers. Every week I read Elon Musk or uh, Zuckerberg or whatever, you know, these guys are building bunkers. So um, obviously that's how an earth dweller thinks. You're going to see later in the Revelation. Also, the earth dwellers know God is coming and judging and the rocks are falling. And they said, hide us from God, hide us from God. What an amazing statement. They know God is doing it. Do they, are they going to repent and change now? They just say, hide us from God. We don't want judgment. We don't want God, but we don't want judgment either. We're going to see that. So uh, what has to happen when the church is gone? There's nobody witnessing to any, anybody in the earth. All those earth dwellers have nobody that tells them about Jesus. So that that is a, a problem number one. Problem number two is, I, I don't know if it's a problem. We should say the focus of the seven years is to save Israel. The whole purpose of the seven years, which is the last part of Daniel's prophecy in 927, where uh, he predicts uh, 483 years, Messiah will come. And then there's a gap, which nobody could know about in the Old Testament, the church age of 2000 years. And then the last seven years, he's going to, uh, it's going to be fulfilled. But those last seven years are for thy people, Daniel's people the jews okay they're not for anybody else well, are gentiles going to be saved of course they are but that's not the focus that's there it's like peripheral <laughs> you know it's like uh use a negative example it's like you know uh, the the uh, jews or israel's bombing uh, gaza right and unfortunately there's a lot of people that aren't combatants that are hurt on the on the outside right they're called per, it's called peripheral damage well, on the positive side, there's going to be peripheral salvations, but that's not the focus. The target, God's targeting uh, the Jews. That's the whole purpose. And we're going to see in Zechariah 12.10 that all of Israel 
are going is going to receive Christ and they're going to see him come back and he's going to see the scars on his hands and everything. They're going to mourn for him as an only son. But, so we keep on going. We want to focus on the book. So what we have here is uh, the first thing God does right up front. I mean, when is it happening? The rapture, these guys seal. As far as I can see, it's immediate. In other words, God never leaves himself without a witness in the earth. So when we're gone, he's not going to leave himself without a witness. And it says they're the first fruits. That means that's the first thing that's going to happen. He's going to seal 144,000 Jews, not Gentiles, not Jehovah's Witnesses. These guys are Jews. So if anybody says, uh, I'm one of the 144,000, the first question you always have to ask him is, which tribe are you from? I've yet to have anybody tell me which tribe they're from. But this, this says, I mean, you know, can you read English here? <laughs> Reuben, Naphtali, Levi, Joseph. If you're not from one of these tribes, you're not the 144,000. Okay, you can, you can twist it however you want to, spin it however you want to, but it's not accurate. After this, he's in a vision state in heaven. He's just seen something. Now, after that vision, it's like he's been he's seen a, a series of audiovisual presentations. He's probably actually there, but however you want to look at it. So the the vision that he saw in chapter six is is done. Now he's getting this brand new parenthetical vision. And it says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Any, any, anytime you see four corners from the, from the Greek standpoint of the Greek here, it means, and we use it today, north, south, east, west. That's the four corners. Can realize they thought the earth was flat. So when, when they said north, east, south, and west, they, they actually were envisioning a flat earth where, where that's, how, that's how they saw it, right? Mm -hmm. So they weren't going around the world. So uh, that's that's their worldview. I saw another angel uh, ascending from the east. Okay. Basically, in the Greek, it says ascending from where the sun comes up. And the seal, he, had, he has the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and sea. Okay. So judgments are coming. That's why another reason why this is the first part, uh, very first thing happens in the seven years rapture in this because what happens is uh he's going to seal these uh 12,000 from each tribe of Jews but he's going to tell the angels who are about to bring judgment hold that judgment back in other words you can't do anything until i've see sealed these people again why is that necessary because he has to have witnesses where did the church go they're nowhere we're gone yeah, I mean, we might pass on, but if not, if we live on to that time, yeah, we're going to be taken. So what we have here is don't harm the uh, the uh, the natural elements of the world, which is going to happen in the plagues. Uh, and so then he goes and he names. Um, this is like the begats, right? It's kind of kind of boring reading through all all these twelve tribes, but. I think he, as God did that so that we have no misunderstanding about who these people are. They're not Gentiles. They, they're, they are Jewish people. Uh, just to put it into uh, context, I want us to realize that uh, we are going to see uh, the next part is the ceiling. Um, and then, of course, followed by the midpoint where we're going to see the martyrdoms really start to kick in. Uh, but the important part here is to realize that in chapter 7, these guys are sealed, guys. I shouldn't use that. These Jewish people, these Jewish evangelists are sealed. And seven years later, in chapter 14, they're seen with Jesus in Jerusalem. So what does sealing mean? When God seals something, the Greek word thragio, when he seals something, it stays sealed. These guys cannot be touched until they have fulfilled their mission. And even after that, because at that time, Christ comes back. So in the beginning, he, he seals these evangelists that go out through the whole world. And even during the times when the Antichrist is killing everybody, he can't touch these people. How do you know that? Well, because the word says in chapter 14 that they come back, that, that when Christ comes back, they're with him at the point where he comes back. So obviously they made it through the seven years of hell on earth. Somehow God has protected them. Nothing can happen to these people. <clears throat> I, it doesn't say that they are, are uh, 
you know, performing great miracles. It doesn't say that they are, you know, like fire shooting out of their eyes or anything. The two witnesses are like that. But apparently these people, their main thing is to go around the world evangelizing very possible miracles. It just doesn't say that. And then at the very end, they're going to be with Christ when he comes back to earth to the Mount of Olives, where uh, Acts chapter 1, the angels say he will come back. So that's what's going to be happening with that. And uh, so that we see it in context here, uh, there is a point C. So we have A, B, and C. And these guys, uh, these Jewish evangelists, are going to uh, be evangelizing the world. So... And that's established right there in this focus. Again, it's kind of like God has this giant microscope, right? And it's like a, a chronoscope. In time, he's focusing on a particular area. He's focusing just on the ceiling of the 144,000 at the very beginning. And then we pull. he pulls it back and changes the lenses a little bit and refocuses it here on the martyrs. Although there's going to be martyrdom in the first three and a half years, there's martyrdom now. So, you know, that's not going to be done away with. I'm sure it'll be a, a stronger persecution in the first three and a half years. The real martyrdom happens when Satan inhabits the Antichrist. He puts the 666 into effect. He says, worship me or you die. And they can't escape because of the surveillance and AI. He knows where everybody is. He's going to track them down. So only the people on the periphery will escape into the deserts. And uh, if they're caught, they also will be executed. And I'll prove that in a little bit longer and a little bit further down. So um, after this, I looked, I saw a multitude too large to count from every nation, tribe, and people in tongue. Okay, so this is how many martyrs there are going to be. So how many is that? Can you put a numeric figure on that? Um, millions upon millions upon millions. Uh, if you consider there's going to be at least 8 billion people in the world, minus the 2 billion that will be wiped out in the initial volley of World War III, uh, the Red Horse, then then you there's at least 6 billion left. And of those 6 billion, how many are going to escape the execution? Uh, the vast majority, I'm sure, are going to say, hey, um, We'll, we'll worship whomever you want us to as long as you keep that money coming. Reminds me a lot of politicians today. Okay. <laughs> Vote for me and I'll give you a chicken in every pot. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it's as old as old as the ages. Nero Nero built the Colosseum so the people would, would stay with him and give him allegiance. And he offered him games and everything so that they wouldn't wouldn't think about not having bread to eat. That's the oldest trick in the book. So anyway, so that's what happens with people and men in politics. So what happens is that as we look, and John's accurately recording this vision, they're all uh, wearing white robes. And uh, that's always indicative of the saints, the holy ones, hagios, holy. And they're waving palm branches. Can you think of another time where there was palm branches waved that we sell? Yeah, every year we celebrate Palm Sunday. So yeah, I think it's kind of building off of that. It's obviously they're welcoming, welcoming the king on Palm Sunday, but here they're, uh, they're uh, wel not welcoming, but, uh, you know, worshiping the king. Uh, then one of the elders addresses me, uh, you know, John's looking at all these, this multitude of millions upon millions, and he's saying, who are these people? And uh, where do they come from, right? So he, he was not uh, yet aware, because the, the martyrdoms in the future hadn't occurred. So he didn't know what was going on there. Interestingly enough, he, he did make it through the martyrdoms of the Caesars, but apparently he didn't recognize these martyrs as the ones he knew from the martyrdom in Rome. So a lot of people don't think about that. These are new people. They're not people he knew as Christians that were martyred in Rome. And these are the ones who have come. Well, in, in case you you missed the boat right there, in case you totally don't understand, he just spells it out. These are the ones who came out of the Great Tribulation. So what was the Great Tribulation? You have seven years, the beginning, 
the middle, when Satan is cast out of heaven, in chapter 12, he inhabits the Antichrist. He's worshipped as God on earth. At that point, the martyrdom starts, and for three and a half years, that's called the great. And I didn't make it up. The word calls it uh, the Lipsis Megalus, the great tribulation. So he he is uh, well aware of what that is here. He, he hasn't gone through it, obviously, but he's, he's getting the idea of this great uh, struggle that's coming. Never again will they hunger. Why would they hunger? Because once once you manage to escape this all-encompassing surveillance system, you're out in the desert. That's the only way you're going to get away from it. Reminds me of some of these sci-fi movies where I've seen, you know, like they had this enclosed city and some people get away within there in the desert, nothing to eat, you know. Uh, so it's like that. So why would they be hungry? Because once once the 666 is implemented, if you don't have the mark, um, I was talking with somebody the other day. Anyway, um, uh, it, I was talking and it, we, it was mentioned that they'd gone into um, a, a store and that they, they it was a cashless store. And uh, it, yeah, so or you, it's cashless, meaning you either had to have your handprint, which is becoming prevalent. I remember going to Disney, I had to do like this. And it never took my, I don't know what's wrong with my fingers, but it, they wouldn't let me in. We had to go through hoops to prove we, we had a ticket, right? But anyway, obviously the system at this point is not perfect, but, but then it's going to be perfect. Probably it's more likely going to be an eyeball scam. You say, that's crazy. No, the guy who's made AI, uh, Alton, uh, he, he uh, is, is now, right now, implementing that system. Certain countries have banned it. But he's implemented, it looks like a little sphere, and, and that's how you get get into the system with the eyeball scanner. So is that crazy, wild stuff? No, that's right now. And I'd say less five years or less, everybody's going to be using that probably. Based on what? Based on how fast I know technology is, is going. I think uh, the, other, the other day in here, I mentioned that knowledge used to increase like every two and a half years, maybe 18 months. And now I've been corrected. Every 24 hours, knowledge is doubling now. So Ooh. when you, when I project some of these things, it's not crazy, Bill. It's based on hard core, core science. You know, that's what's coming. That's how fast it's coming. That's why people don't understand how fast it's coming. Because if it doesn't affect them every day, they think it's not happening. We're out there. It is happening all over the world. But anyway, they're not going to hunger. They're not going to thirst. All right. What happens when you go to the desert? You can't find anything to eat. You can't drink anything unless you're fortunate enough to find a creek. Uh, it reminds me, who's that prophet that ran off and uh, the ravens fed him? Uh, I think it was Ezekiel. Elijah. Elijah. I knew it started with an E. Well, all, all those E guys, you know. Anyway, thank you. I'm glad somebody reads the Bible. Okay, so uh, what we have here is scorching heat. Okay, well, again, I, all this to me speaks of the desert. And, and again, uh, there's there's many people that believe that there's going to be a remnant who will escape into probably Petra or somewhere out there. There was a whole city, uh, the Nabataeans built a whole city out there and had a civilization for 100 years called Petra in the middle of the desert. And they had this, this great irrigation system. But anyway... I digress, but a lot of people think that's where everybody's going to end up there, that uh, it escapes the Antichrist. So anyway, so the, they're out in the desert somewhere because they're hungry, they, they're thirsty, and, they, and they're they're getting sun, uh, so so much sun there, they're getting overheated and scorched. And the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Of course, it's talking about when they get to heaven, he's a martyr. And he will let, lead them to springs of living water. He will wipe away every tear. Okay, so uh, that's all to say that uh, these these judgments are going to uh, be so severe that the people who are not executed, they're going to uh, go through a horrible, horrible time. They will be alive. Some of them will escape. And you have to say, okay, how how could they make it through? Well, that's God's grace and the fact that they're out of the reach of the Antichrist. In chapter 12, it says that the Antichrist pursues them with a flood. And but the earth, God caused the earth to swallow it up. So right there, it tells you that the ones that make it to this fortress, wherever wherever the believers are going, are going to have uh they're going to have a situation where God is protecting them supernatural. I think we can understand that. 
doesn't go into great detail because I guess we don't need to know the specifics of every little thing. Yes, sir. Real quick. Um, well, the believers are already gone in the rapture, but then these are the believers that accept God or Jesus in the, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation or the second half? Well, they, they'll be accepting Jesus throughout all the seven years. Gotcha. Okay, that's the ones that go out into the wilderness and the fortresses and all that. Yeah, so these are believers, but they're not Christians. And that's a tough concept for okay. us. But not Christians in the sense of being the church. We're born-again people. We're the bride of Christ. Okay. So the bride of Christ is going up to heaven where we're going to be celebrating with Jesus for seven years. And then we're going to come back with him, and we're going to have, uh, you know, a continuation of, of the feasting, what have you, and we actually will be the government of the earth. So you may not be a politician, but you should get ready, because I don't, I don't know if you're going to be a politician, but you're going to be a governor of the, of the world. So not only that, the word says we're going to judge angels, which is a tough one, right? How can the word says that the believers will judge angels? Paul's talking about, I can't remember which, I think it's in Corinthians, but wherever it is. He's talking about a, they had a dispute, and he says, Can't you guys settle that dispute? Don't you know that we'll even judge angels? Has anybody here read that, or am I going crazy? Oh, good. I got a few people. Okay. Good. You know, you got to catch me if I make up stuff. I hope I don't make up stuff. But at any rate, so yeah, so yeah, what I tried to do earlier was, was uh, let me see if I can back up to that little chart. Yeah, so here in the tribulation believers in the seven years, you're going to have, uh, unlike now where you have the church, Jews and Gentiles, you're going to have tribulation believers, but they're not church people. If they were, we are presented with a real problem. Not only are they not mentioned for chapter six through 19, for seven years, they're not mentioned but also the fact that the church is the bride of Christ. So if we're up there with Jesus and we're the bride, then who are these people? Is Jesus a polygamist? Uh, that's probably what it is. These people are his second bride. We're going to have two brides. Now, wait a minute. Let me think that through. That doesn't sound right. Of course, that's crazy talk. Mm -hmm. So people think, you know, people that think the church is going through here, they don't get it. They don't understand that these are different believers. And, and and the only word used about these believers are saints. But saints has a wide meaning. In the Greek, it's hagios. Uh, remember, the big church in uh, Istanbul called uh, Hagios Sophia, meaning the, the whole wisdom, holy wisdom. But anyway, so hagios means uh, holy ones or separated ones. In the Hebrew, it actually means separated. So when when uh, when you come to God and you be bo you're born again, you're separated unto him. Doesn't mean you're physically separated. It means spiritually now you're his, right? And you're separated to him, whether you act like it or not. And uh, the rest of the people, they are not part of the Hagios. But these people are saints. They're only called saints in the English. In the Greek, they're called the, the uh, Hagios, holy ones. So, uh, but the way the way that they behave and everything that goes on is totally different. Uh, and and so what we have is tribulation believers. So will people will be saved? Yes. And a lot of the people that are going to be saved after the Antichrist proclaims himself, God are going to be the Jewish people. There is a believing Jewish remnant. And so at first they're going to be fooled. You have to understand the first three and a half years, the whole purpose Satan's concept is to bring his Hitler figure for the first three and a half years a great leader who fixes all the world's problems, the greatest guy since sliced bread, genius of geniuses, and but that's not even the real point. The real point is he's going to make a treaty with Israel to rebuild the temple. So it's going to be, uh, it'll be meaningless. All the sacrifices will be, everything they used to do, they're going to do, but it has no meaning now because Judaism is dead, totally dead. The day Christ uh, died on that cross and the temple veil was rent, Judaism died, and it's never been alive. It will never be alive again. There is no Judaism today. There's a religion called Judaism, but there's no religion called Judaism that's that God's part of. So uh, what we're going to see here, however, is that the Jews in this time, when especially when Antichrist goes into the temple and proclaims himself God, they're going to start to wake up. Because what is the main reason that they didn't receive Christ? 
Does anybody know what? Why did they reject Christ? Because he said he was God, right? And although he was, they, they had a misconception. They rejected him. Because, and why was that? Because the chief commandment in the Ten Commandments is, thou shall have no other God. So Jesus came and said, I'm God. So in their mentality, well, he's a, he's a usurper. He's a, he's a fake. To this day, they believe, he didn't believe he's a fake. And so when Antichrist, their beloved false Messiah, they're going to really think he's Messiah. And so they're going to say, uh, if Messiah comes, could he do greater works than this man? If Messiah comes, is he going to build the temple? This man built the temple. You can just hear him have a little debate. And so, but then he's going to go into the temple, into the rebuilt Holy of Holies, sit down and say, I am God. You know, he's going to have a CNN world conference. The whole world's going to see this. And when he says he's God, even the hard, hardcore Jews are going to go, Oy vey, this can't be Messiah. They're going to they're gonna turn against him. They're going to flee. Uh, all, not all of them. How many Jews uh, were uh, beholden to the Romans? How many Jews, even though they knew this, even the leader of, this, of the Sanhedrin, the chief Jew of Jews, said it's better for this guy to die. They knew who he was. They knew he was Messiah. They said it's better for this guy to die than our nation should perish. They were only interested in having the, having their influence and power. And this guy was rocking the boat. So what we got to do is kill this guy so we don't lose our cushy little positions with Rome. And that's what that's what's going to happen again. There's going to be plenty of Jews that go, oh yeah, yeah, I know, you know, he doesn't really mean it. You know, they're going to take the mark. Ah, oh, whatever, take the mark. I'm making it. I'm making a living here. They're not. They're not going to uh, flee. But a lot of the Jews, the serious, you know, ones who are trying to believe God in their own way, they're going to. They're going to split. They're going to go to the desert, along with the with the the un unbelieving earth dwellers. I'm not going to call them Gentiles because there's only two classes of people at that time: earth dwellers and the tribulation saints, the holy ones. Okay, so I hope I've I've answered your question about that. One. Okay, other questions. I